So, hello guys, and welcome to this new video. Today I'm here to present you Silent 1.4 Binary Counters and also a Universe Death Clock uh, using Silent 1.4 Redstone. So, first of all, let's give you the backstory behind this thing. Um, yeah, today, uh, yesterday I released a video, a technical video. It basically summarized a lot of the work I've been doing in the past time, and as a result, I didn't really have anything left I have been doing lately, which we are which I think is worth covering in a technical micro video. So, I was kind of stuck, so yeah, no, no filters or anything like that, and I thought, well, I think it's time to, well, play our Joker I've kind of been keeping behind for now. So, yeah, basically since January I have worked in, on some um, interesting redstone. Well, it wasn't that interesting. In general, I did some, a bit of interesting redstone. I always thought it was worth a video, but I never I never really got around to it, because I always had other interesting and actual act like recent stuff I wanted to talk about, but I think now is a good time to showcase that. So, with that being said, let's get into the uh, reason I made it back then, being that uh, Redstone Jazz, also in January, I believe, released a video, uh, I think it was called Pre-1.5, um, yeah, Pre-1.5, uh, what am I trying to say? Pre-1.5 Universe Death Clock, yes indeed. So basically he made Universe Death Clock, which means a clock which runs for Google years uh, before it triggers, anything. Um, he made that just using repeaters, torches, redstone, and also he did use sticky pistons for pulse generators, unfortunately. So he could have made it as well without that, but then it would have, been a, have to be a bit bigger. But it's not a big deal. So anyway, uh, that's why I called it pre-1.5, as it would be like real old-school redstone. Now, I thought a bit about that, and I was like, hmm, well, this is nice with the prime number clocks and such, and he, he combines them you know, to get to very long periods. However, uh, I thought maybe it's interesting to just use binary count, a binary counter in order to get to it. So what is a binary counter first? Uh, very simple actually. You basically just, the output is just a binary number you could say. You have like a register, uh, sorry, a, a, an array of bits. So in this case, five bits. The, um, each has a value, of course. Uh, it, it's a form of memory. And basically every time, the idea of a, uh, a binary counter is every time you send a pulse into the input, it will um, basically, um, yeah, just uh, basically simulate one being added to the binary counter. So you have one, uh, zero, one, 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 so next number will be one, zero, 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 zero. Like that. So yeah, basically what that means is every time it passes in by one bit, it sets the bit to zero, and uh, it uh, goes on to the next bit, if it passes by a zero bit, it sets the bit to one and stops. That's how binary counting works, you could say. It's kind of logical if you know what binary is and the way, you know, um, counting systems work, uh, different uh, number systems work, but whatever. That's how it works. This is how I've worked using sticky pistons. It makes it fairly easy using these one pull generators. And I wanted to know a more interesting challenge. So this is one without having to use resin blocks, I believe. I don't know. I wanted to do something cool here. Um, and this is a more interesting one, which doesn't use pistons, uh, except for the input mechanism. However, you could easily replace it by something else. Uh, let me just show you. Every time I press the button, as you can tell, the array changes. And now, next time I press it, it should clear all those first bits and go up to here. And also, we have a reset up here, which resets all bits to zero. So yeah, anyway, I think that's pretty cool. Uh, we can also put it on a clock, save the next one. And uh, yeah, I think that's pretty cool. Uh, this just uses the actual units themselves are two by... Uh, if you don't have, wait, if you doesn't matter if you have reset. Well, okay, let's not count the resets. So that it means it's four high. It is two wide, and it is one two three four five one two three four five six seven blocks long. So seven by two fourteen times four is fifty six blocks normally. So let me show you. I'm not gonna um, include a schematic for this one or for the next design I'll show because they are so small. However, I will show you right here how they work, so you can also copy it. So this is one side. There needs to be a torch right here. Th th this will be coming from the previous one. For the first bit, you just I need to uh, three tick pulls going into that. So need that. Um, and then from there on, basically you have this on the other side. So that's how it works. You shove that all into each other, and then you get a large array. You can like like over here. Also, let's stop this clock. I don't I don't like to keep clocks running when I don't use them because then I forgot about them. Anyway, um, so the way it works pretty simple. A three tick pulse passes into here. So whatever happens, it will try to set the um, latch. To, to, uh, so set means that it turns it to uh, one bit, turn it on, uh, reset, 
prompts have up here, it turns it off. So as you can tell, this is just a latch. The side turns it on, the side turns it off. Um, so yeah, the latch just works. Dust, torch, torch, and so on. Um, what also happens is basically when a signal passes through and this latch is off, then this torch will also be off. And what that means, basically, a three tick, uh, this torch will be, uh, so basically a three tick on signal will go into this block. And then this torch will, one tick later, this torch will stay off for three ticks. And then um, at the same time, this block will turn on basically. And then one tick later, this uh, one will turn off. And then one tick later, this one will turn off. And basically one tick later again, this one will turn on again. So as a result, whenever you send that three tick pulls into here, it will, and the latch is um, empty, you could say, or zero. This will only turn off for zero ticks, uh, for, zero, for one tick. And that will not be enough to uh, turn the and torch on, as you maybe know. Same thing for the and torch in here. Uh, however, when this latch is set, like this, this torch will be off already. And as a result, um, these three ticks from here will just pass through. And the activa uh, activate both this torch and this torch. Um, both sending a signal on to the next one with equal uh, pulse length, that's very important. While also resetting the latch. So yeah, that's basically how it works. Uh, I, thought, I thought it was cool back in the day. I built this, I think, like one and a half years ago, a really long time ago. But um, since then, oh, no. All of my precious farming research. Oh well. No one saw that. Um, anyway, over here we've got a more interesting design, in my opinion. Let me also turn it off this thing because I don't like stuff running. Um, anyway, the way this works basically is you have um, a pull sign, as I called, and a data line. So over here you've got, as you can tell, repeaters. Some of them are locked. This is what I call the pulse line, and down here you've got the data line. Again, all of them are locked. Um, and what locks them? Well, it basically they are locked by the previous uh, bits on the other line. So if you look at the pulse line right here, uh, if this one is on, then it will turn off that repeater, and it will unlock this repeater. If this one is on, then it will uh, empower this repeater and unlock this one, and so on. So basically, um, as a result, uh, every time you send a tick pulse in, it will basically, so for the first uh, bit, basically works like pretty simple. Um, this one turns off, it uh, turns off for just long enough so the repeater can change the state, because as you can tell right here we've got a clock, but we constantly block it from continuing. Um, so that way the block and the clock advances by one, basically it advances from on to off or on off to on every time you send a signal through. So that's pretty cool. Um, and then from there on basically it's every time so yeah basically the pulse uh, signal which travels through here will be blocked because if the latch is off and it will be allowed to go through if the latch is on uh, however when because the latch is on it will also um, be if, if the pulse are already arrived here that means that if the latch is on it will also uh, empower uh, unlock the latch Allowing this uh, the pulse to uh, sorry the signal to travel to the next uh, repeater if that, that one is unlocked, um, and if uh, and it will also lose its state in that sense. I know I built this a half year ago in January. I don't entirely know how it works anymore, but it works. It's pretty cool, as you can tell. Every time you press the button, it will just carry the signal onwards. And yeah, that's how it works. And something you may have noticed uh, is that basically these. Um, so yeah, first of all, if you want to build your, for yourself, all repeaters are one except for the, the lines. The data line and pulse line both have two tick repeaters. So something you may have noticed there is actually that this entire thing is kind of symmetrical. You know, at least in the sense that um, the pulse and data line just block each other on the next uh, repeater. That's all there is to it, really. And as a result, you can just have um, the pulse line go up here again, uh, like this or something, uh, and the lower line, and then have the same upper line, just mirror this time around, uh, up here, and that will work just fine, um, because, well, because basically there's nothing really inherently different about these two lines, just about the signal you sent in at the beginning. So that's what we basically ended up doing here. Uh, this is an expansion, where you basically have the four of these layers on top of each other, I believe. So yeah, one, two, three, four, up to here. 
So it goes from here to here. Then the that line goes th uh, through these two torches up to here. And now it's on the upper line, as you can tell. And the, the, this one is on the upper line, just has to go two blocks up. So uh, one, two, and then it's... Oh, sorry, it just has to go one block up. So one, two, and then it, it's over here. And that way you basically have... And then over here again, it will go three blocks up. So one, two, three. And it's on the side, just one block. And so on. And then basically it goes back. So yeah, as you can tell, this you could, this design is really nice because you can just shove it right into each other with these blocks in between, that kind of stuff. So yeah, I really like it as a result. It's kind of some would say it's kind of an example of beauty of redstone. Uh, yeah, it just allows for real nice, really nice compacting. And so you only so you could say in the limit if you have real big ones of these like this, the the, the bigger your uh, array gets, the closer the uh, volume per uh, bit will get to 16 blocks because that's really what it gets down to if you ignore supporting blocks and server land so yeah that's pretty cool uh, I'll just show you this array in action right here so this is on a clock of course we're using pistons right here but again this is just for the initialization um, after that's done you can just break all of this and the clock will continue running so it's really just a ma an easy way to turn the clock on and off but it's completely independent it doesn't use it actually for its normal functions so yeah, with that being said, um, I can show you this thing in action, but it's pretty slow as you can tell, so I'll just go for a tick speed 500 or something, and then you can see that uh, every time a um, bit goes through, so now it goes to there, 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 and now it's all the way through over here, and so on and so forth, basically. I can show you the next one, maybe, and after that I think I'll stop, because it takes a bit long. Yeah, so anyway, that's working fine. So I think that was pretty cool. However, if you want to go to universe death clock and we want to keep it as compact as possible, you have to consider that well, we have to go for a certain width and height. Where you, basically we use a certain amount of components in width and, and some amount in height. In this case, uh, this is what I consider four wide and four high. So if one, two, three, four bits like this, and one, two, three, four bits like this. Also, something important to note is that um, these two are the same bits. Very important. Then there's no latch in between there or anything. They're just the same, but then I need to have both of them, those torches there. Um, anyway, with that being said, um, I think. Uh, is there anything I need to mention? Oh, yeah, right. So now we're going to get into mathematics because everyone loves mathematics. Be warned. Um, so, first of all, the bl bl uh, the amount of blocks uh, of width in uh, is going to be two times the amount of width bits or width units plus three. Why three? Well, you can count it out basically one. And then two, three, and then over here you have two blocks per bit every time. So yeah, that's how that's counted. Um, then height is two times every height unit plus one because you need the supporting blocks at the bottom. Um, then the amount, total amount of units, a bit more complex. Um, the amount of width units, so the, in the bottom right there, then the amount of height units, like that, minus half of the height units floored. What does that mean? Basically, and here we have gotten ourselves uh, four layers, so one, two, three, four. The top one doesn't count, it doesn't work. Uh, might as well remove it, I guess. So, basically, uh, because these two bits are the same, you only really have seven bits on the layer like this. So, how you could say this layer has four bits, and this one three, then this one four, then this one three, and so on. So, basically, um, if you have two, if your uh, height units are, is equal to two, then you have one layer which you need to subtract one from. If it's uh, three, then it's still one. If it's four, then it's two, and so on. So basically, that just means that you uh, divide it by two and you round it down. That's the amount of layers in you which are going to have one less. And as a result, if you subtract that from the uh, just the uh, multiplication, uh, sorry, from the product of the two, then you get the total amount of units. Now the area, which is basically did like this, the width and height multiplied, which is the width and height multiplied, surprisingly. And the depth is constant, it's just for, uh, there's no, not really a point in trying to stack it, put stuff next to each other, because in red stoning terms, we just count the volume as the cubic volume. You don't have to try to make it like more like a cube. It works uh, just well like a big cube or like this. Um, so yeah, that basically, now we can do a bit of mathematics. So first of all, the amount of width units will be equal to the, this thing, which is based on this. If you fill in 358 for units, because we need at least 358 units, the actual mathematical problem is we have to minimize area with 
at least 258 units actually does not be equal. Uh, and uh, the width units and the height units need to be natural numbers. So that basically leaves you up to this. We also seal the entire result again, uh, we got from here, because we need to make sure that it is a whole number. Uh, then we get, oh, then there's also one thing, the area will basically be equal to, well, this just this times this. Then you can fill in this uh, this value we got from for W U in here, and then we get this formula. As you can tell, uh, basically we replaced uh, height units by x here because this will be entered into a calculator in a second. So we basically take six x as you can tell, and then other stuff is just from there. If you want to follow the algebra, just pause the video. Then we get that. But the thing is that it's very important that we only use a whole values for height units or x in this case. So that's why I took this and I replaced um, x by floor x in every instance. Uh, and then basically the last thing is just a full plot link because everyone loves full plots, easy online uh, plotter. And because this link is a bit too much to copy for you guys right now, probably I uh, advise you just uh, check the description and I should normally have put it in there. So using full plot, I looked around and it was pretty easy to find the minimal value, which is. 11 height units, which translates to 33 width units, which happens to translate exactly to 358 units. So it's a really nicely compacted machine. Um, not so like it just translates to 350, uh, 360, sorry. Uh, then in blocks, that means uh, 69 blocks wide, 23 blocks long, 4 blocks deep, as we already knew. And that will translate to an, a total volume of 6,348 uh, 6, blocks for our total universe death clock and that is the, the clock you see right here this one is 33 bits wide on the bottom layer and 11 layers high so yeah uh, let me just show you well the thing is already running actually but as you can tell this thing is just so big that really you, you can't really get to the important bits on the next layer so you just get to know the bits on the first layer but so technically it should work I did a lot of calculations and, and I thought a lot about it and used smaller tests and normally this should go to up to Google years. Um, as in, basically that means that this lamp will turn on every 245 years. This lamp will turn on every 221st years. This one will turn on every 241st years. This one 1061st, 1081st, and finally 1200th. That's one Google years for you guys. Um, so yeah, that's the universe death clock. It works. If you want to reset it, you have to wait for a long time. It works, but as you can tell, the it takes some time to, uh, yeah, basically put all the bits to um, zero. Well, actually, when it's off, it turns on to one. That's the thing. Also, the clock will turn off uh, to one. So you have to kind of do this and then but still wait for a bit of time. <laughs> that's how slow this thing is. So basically, we should wait a bit and bow. And now the entire clock should be in a solid state. Or I mean, in a, 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 a single state, it shouldn't be changing its state anymore. A constant state, yes. Anyway, uh, this video is already, uh, This is the second take I did. The previous one was 70 minutes. I wasn't happy with it. This one's 18. <laughs> but yet, I think I explained stuff a bit better, so I will be uploading this one. Anyway, uh, thanks for watching, people. I hope you liked this video, even if you didn't. Please leave a rating. And uh, yeah, next week I hope I will be back on schedule uh, with more normal videos. And thanks for watching, and I hope I will see you in another video.